Hello again and welcome. I hope things are going well for you. Uh, if this is uh, if this online schooling is kind of a new experience for you, you're probably running into some hassles and obstacles and confusions and all of that. Um, and we'll take it pretty easy for a while. I mean, I, I know I'm having um, some problems I didn't anticipate in, in just getting all of this to work. Um, such is life. Uh, life is trouble, and overcoming trouble is uh, uh, well, meeting challenges. That's kind of what defines us, and also where we find the satisfactions that we do find in life. Uh, let me share my screen. Um, in our last session, I talked about the difference between simple narration and actual story. And narration describes a, a series of events. Um, usually they're causally connected. Um, but story has form. And the, the, the primary way we see the form is that it, it comes to an end. It has a point. It has some meaning. It's, it's, it's uh, a story is always leading the reader towards some sort of revelation. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit more about story before we get into it, just because I found that it's really hard to get writers out of the essay mindset and into the story mindset. Um, you ask people to write a story, but what they turn in is mainly an essay. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit more about how stories work. And it's interesting. I think it's interesting. Uh, writers trying to write a story, uh, if they haven't done it a lot, often fall into explainery. In other words, telling rather than showing. I gave an assignment once for students to write about a significant experience they had gone through a couple wrote about their grandmother's deaths, and one wrote about the death of a pet dog. Now, I'm, I'm not making fun of that. I'm sure those all were um, uh, intense experiences. But what I found interesting was how similar the different stories were. Uh, they basically all said about the same thing, and I didn't really learn anything about them or their experience. The problem was that all the writers shifted from telling a story into explaining how they felt about something. Well, we all know what grief feels like, and it feels about the same for everybody. What this means is trying to explain how you feel will be very predictable, which is to say, boring. Storytellers know that their readers already know what grief it feels like. Their job isn't to explain how they feel. Their job is to evoke the situation which will trigger those same feelings of grief that the audience is already familiar with. You, uh, you need to show them uh, something happening in which what's happening will cause them to have a feeling. What you're not trying to do is to explain the feeling to them. Um, Consider the kind of questions those writers writing about their um, deaths of pets and grandmothers could have asked themselves when they were writing. Where were you when you learned your grandmother had died? Very specifically, what room were you in? What color were the walls? What was the light, light like? What smells were there? Don't tell me how you felt. Recreate the situation. Tell me the story. Put me there. If you saw your grandmother, where was she? If she was in bed, what color was the bedding? Describe the expression on her face. Pay attention to her hands. Who else was in the room? What else was going on? Provide more physical description of the person and the place. And if someone gave you the news, who was it? Describe them. Bring them into the scene and let me see them. Uh, including their gestures and facial expressions, uh, their, the way they uh, take care of their hair, the clothes they're wearing. What did they say exactly? Put it in dialogue and have them say it. Let me see them and let me hear them. Let me find out about the, the, the tragic event in as close as possible 
exactly the same way you found out about it. Give me that experience. Don't tell me how it made you feel. If you can describe the, the setting, the room you were in, the characters, uh, who told you, your grandmother, and the dialogue precisely enough, picking up details that communicate what caught your attention, your reader will feel the emotion you were feeling. You won't need to say things like, I was sad or I was devastated. If you show accurately enough, any telling you do will actually tend to rob the scene of its emotion. Part of the reason writing is hard, and this is all writing, not just story writing, um, but I, w I want you to think about it for a moment because it, it kind of this will kind of explain why we have to go through several drafts to get a good piece of writing. Uh, the, the, the cliche among writers is there is no good writing, there's only good rewriting. And the reason is that writing is complex. And by, I'm using complex the way ecosystem biologists do. It means a system uh, in which things are happening on various levels. Something that's complex has levels. Um, so when we're, when we're talking about writing, the highest level, the big level, uh, is the outline, the main ideas, the main actions, the blueprint, the abstract structure. Uh, you, you, uh, you either need to pre uh, get that figured out before you start or you can revise and revise and revise and figure it out while you work. Generally, it's much easier to get an outline uh, nailed down before you start writing. And then uh, the next level down is, is the level of the story itself, the development, what facts you bring into the story, what anecdotes you tell, what uh, places you describe, all of the, the content of the story. And then the lowest, the simplest level is the copy editing level. The grammar, the style, the conventions, do your subjects and verbs agree? Um, are your commas used correctly? Um, do you have modifiers that are dangling or infinitives that are split? You know, that sort of thing. Um, and, at, and at the copy edit level, there is virtually no difference between stories and essays. At the content level, there may be a little difference. Both stories and essays may include the basic ways of developing a piece of writing, description, facts, arguments, anecdotes, reasons. But at the conceptual level, uh, they are quite different. Essays are about conveying information or making arguments. They have illogical structures. Essays have points. You have a main point and three supporting minor points in a five paragraph essay. Well, stories don't have points. Stories have scenes. And what's going on in scenes is characters are taking actions. Uh, stories have a climactic structure, not, not a logical structure, not an argumentative structure. Um, and it's in, in the fact that stories show us what characters do and then what consequences follow, that uh, that's kind of why storytellers are the shamans of the tribe. Their job is to bring back to the people stories that give us a frame of reference, something to compare our lives to, models of how we should live, or as with Macbeth, models of how we should not live. Um, it's true that I think that in an in a important way, um, stories are always a form of moral discourse. Uh, there's a, certainly great literature is always a form of moral discourse. It's telling us stories to get us to understand uh, the world better, what works, what is worth approving, what is worth seeking, what is not. Um, in, in stories, usually the big ideas, those themes that we've talked about, are not stated directly. Um, and if, you know, when, you, when you do state a theme, you end up usually um, s expressing a cliché. Uh, true love will never die. Um, you need to be honest to be liberated uh, into freedom. Um, 
Uh, anyway, back on the nature of complexity, um, uh, I want to focus in a little bit more on, I just, I just mentioned that um, uh, complex systems have levels, but what defines a level is that you need to use different concepts and different tools to observe it or, or to analyze it. Uh, when a doctor is trying to figure out what's wrong with you, he he's aware that the the problem might be something on the cellular level. It might be something on the level of tissues and organs. It might be something on the level of your personality and your your tendency to over worry about things. Uh, but notice that he has to use different tools to look at those different levels to see what he can find. To examine the cellular level, uh, he uses a microscope. If you want to think about the dietary habits, how, how has this patient been living, you use the interview. You talk to the person at the level of conscious conversation. Um, to understand humans better, we can look at cells or tissues or organs or systems, such as the circulatory system or the respiratory system. And we can even look at higher levels, looking at individual humans interacting with larger systems, such as communities and populations. I mean, that's the level where we see things like uh, how is Black Lives Matter affecting people, different people? How is it influencing them? But it is something that's coming from above the level of the person, from higher in the system. Um, and the, the practical um, meaning of all this for writing is that you have to use different mental tools to check whether the verb and the subject agree than you use to think about whether the second topic sentence is developed well enough. Uh, well, you can't use those different mental tools at the same time. You can only use them one at a time. So good writing requires multiple drafts. You can't think about whether your points are in the right order at the same time you're thinking about whether your apostrophes are used correctly. We have to do several um, drafts of a piece, and all of us do, uh, because we need to read through it, um, several times focusing sometimes on the apostrophes and sometimes on the truthfulness of the claims. So, things that are complex have more than one level. And a level is the point at which you change tools or concepts. And different levels um, have completely different rules and require a different, completely different kind of attention. Um, a story, let's get back to story. Essays are about thoughts and ideas, but stories are about characters and actions. Um, character in any sense that we can get at it is action and action is plot. That's what Henry James said. Let me say it again. Character in any sense that we can get at it is action. We don't really know what a character is or who it is until we see how it acts, how it responds. And action is plot. It, uh, the main plot points in a well-made story are always actions made by the character. Uh, like one mistake people make when they're writing story is that they think great big events will make the story interesting. So they put so they put the character in the middle of a big hurricane with trees falling and all of that stuff. Well, you know that's actually not very interesting, and it isn't where where interest in stories really comes from. You, that's not what it is. If within that hurricane, uh, a tree has fallen on a woman's two children. They're both trapped, the water is rising, and she can save one of them, but not both of them, then she has to make a decision. And it's that choice that's, that's it's, I, mean, I mean, when you see her facing that choice and you understand it, you feel all the all kinds of things the character in that situation would feel. But it's, it's the, what the character does, it's what that mother does that is at the heart of the plot and not the fact that the wind was blowing. <clears throat> I, I kind of, I'm going to go through a, the basic formula for a Hollywood story, not because I expect you to write anything as long or complicated as a Hollywood movie. I don't. Um, 
but because Hollywood really gets story. I mean, the very idea that there's a formula is really interesting because uh, the reason there's a formula is trial and error. I mean, Hollywood um, filmmakers generally have created lots and lots and lots of stories and then they put them out on the market. And then some stories, a lot of people are willing to pay money to see, maybe even to see more than once. And other stories, um, nobody goes and tells their friends, you've got to see it, you've got to see it. They just sort of die there. And so they've, they've, they've had a lot of experience of focusing in on, on what makes a story work. And um, what makes it work is understanding of some universal human um, needs. So let's let's just um, let's just follow the formula um, through one story. I'll, I'll I'll use Titanic. I hope you've all seen it. Uh, if but this will make enough sense to you even if you haven't. Um, stage one is the setup. In the setup, you introduce the hero. You create a little bit of identification with the hero. You show the world before the complication, before the conflict. Um, and at the end of stage one, there's a turning point. Um, a new opportunity arises. Um, in Titanic, Rose, at the beginning of the story, is embedded in a world of wealth and privilege. And the setup lasts the first 10 minutes. Then um, you, you, you move into stage two. A new situation creates a new desire. The new desire is not just the hero's main goal in the story. I mean, it's it's that that will come later. The main goal. This first desire is is just uh, something as mild as a desire to go somewhere new. Usually, the hero thinks it will be fun or easy. Um, stage two consists of the hero and the audience getting familiar with the new situation, and at the end of the stage, another turning point occurs. Something happens that make, makes the hero begin to pursue the main goal of the story. In Titanic, um, it may be when the girl gets on the ship. In The Firm, it may be when the young lawyer learns the company is a front for the mob and he needs to get out. It, this is when the real story gets underway. The hero... Um, begins to make a plan. In... in Titanic, Jack and Rose meet when Rose contemplates suicide and Jack saves her. Rose is getting so comfortable with living on the Titanic, but then she begins to see the world of expression and freedom that Jack lives within as she looks at his drawings. Um, and this stage two um, uh, lasts about um, 25 minutes, or about 25 minutes into the film. Um, stage three, change of plan. Um, the hero deals with obstacles and complications, and then at the midpoint, the, the hero reaches um, another turning point. Uh, you, you see this turning point in the firm. It's the point when the hero says, are you telling me my life is in danger? And the answer is, I'm telling you your life as you knew it is over. The hero um, is nearer at this point to the destination, to the origin. That's 50 minutes in. Um, if you follow the complications in Titanic, Rose has a, has a magical night out with Jack and she feels her life beginning to change, but the next morning she holds back. Uh, she rejects Jack's tempting charm. And Rose's mother reminds her of what's at stake if she endangers her engagement to Cal. And it's, it's off stage, and it's not a character, it's action, but it's adding to the drama. The captain receives a warning about icebergs, but decides to increase the ship's speed. Um, and Rose reverts back to her pro protected wealth for a while, and, but then she does make the decision to go with Jack. And stage four, it's just higher stakes, worse complications. Uh, everything you do to solve the problem seems to land you in deeper trouble. Um, and this this will take us through the 75 minutes of the film usually. Rose commits to Jack after she realizes that she's not happy with her husband-to-be. Um, they run off together, but they're chased by the fiancé's manservant. 
they have uh, they make love in a car right before the ship hits the Titanic, and that's that's a uh, everything changes. The Titanic collides with the iceberg. Water begins seeping into the room where Jack is imprisoned. The ship completely sinks, and Rose and Jack are are stranded in the freezing water. The ship's bow goes completely under, and the sinking really is finalized. And each of these events is important because the characters have to respond. They have to act in response to it. Um, stage five is, is do or die. It's that moment when um, uh, the character uh, maybe decides to fight the villains. There's a whole bunch of them, but he turns around and walks right into the midst of them. And what you know watching the film is in about five minutes, Either they're all going to be dead or he's going to be dead. It's the do or die moment. Uh, the sh in, in the Titanic, the ship completely sinks and Rose and Jack are, are stranded in the freezing water and Rose realizes that Jack is dead and she keeps her promise to him by fighting to get to the whistle and to be rescued. When he met her, she was suicidal. And at this point, you see the huge change in her. She is fighting mightily to survive. And then stage six is the aftermath, the resolution. Um, the hero achieves the goal or fails. Either, either is possible in a story. Uh, but what we need, what the audience in a film needs to see is the new life that is being lived after the story. Uh, to feel satisfied, the audience has to experience the emotional consequences of the story. Uh, how is the world now, after all of that that happened? And the length of the aftermath varies. It can be just a very few moments, or it can go on for quite a while. But, um, but the audience needs to experience the resolution. In the Titanic, it's We See Rose as an Old Woman. Um, thinking back fondly on a life well lived and well lived, um, the story implies because of the influence on her of um, Jack. Oh, I forgot to advance through these. Okay, this will be a review. The setup, the new situation, the change of plans, higher stakes, worse complications, do or die, and the aftermath. The stages of a Hollywood story. Um, notice that stories aren't about arguments or facts. They're about what the character does. Um, the character wants something. I mean, the, the real driving motor of a story is that the character wants something. We kind of, uh, if the character doesn't want anything, there's no story. The character is driven, the story is driven by the character's desire. Um, because the character wants something, and it, it, the conflict can be minor in real life. I'm, I'm trying to um, record a lecture, and a fly lands on my nose. Now I've got a conflict. I have a desire. I want the fly gone, um, and so I act. I swing, swat at it, and and it goes away. Um, um, the characters are known by their actions. Their actions lead to conflict and conflict creates emotion. And, the, and the, the conflict forces a decision and the de decision always reveals core values. It's that part that makes um, stories nearly always a part of moral discourse because what you decide to do depends on what you think really matters in life. Um, every character does that. <clears throat> Um, there's some real value, I think, to, to thinking about stories and to learning to write them. Um, Henry James, the novelist, um, famously said once, adventures happen to people who know how to tell it that way. And kind of what he's getting at is that um, people who know how to tell stories seem to have really interesting lives. They've always got a new story. People who don't, haven't, aren't really good at converting the experiences they've lived into stories, meaningful stories, um, uh, it's probably not that they're not having an interesting life. It's probably that they're not paying enough attention to what things around them mean. 
Um, stories might be obvious once they're told, but it takes some a kind of intelligence to see what could be a story or what kind of story it could be in, in the midst of all the massive events and details that surround us all the time. Um, making a story can be quite a profound thing. They aren't just there. We make stories out of our experience by defining what is a complication seeing well what are the causal connections what what's making this happen and deciding then what counts as a resolution um, maybe maybe the resolution is i decide i don't need to fight that dragon today and so i go back to my shelter um, we don't all narrate our experience in the same way and our lives are shaped by the way we do learn um, how to tell stories and we inherit a lot of the patterns from our families and an awful lot from our culture in, in, in the case of all of us that probably means Hollywood uh, uh, we, we, we kind of tend to t create the stories of our lives in ways that they fit into patterns that we have um, learned that we grew up with but in any case the more time people spend turning the events of their lives into story the richer and more powerful their experience of life will be uh, some people have a talent for it and they do it um, naturally and easily but everyone can learn to do it well we all do do it everyone can learn to do it better complication developments resolution um, Yeah, I, I'm going to talk about, well, maybe I, I won't, um, just, uh, I, I, I want to talk about a focus statement, uh, a focus, a series of focus statements are how you create an outline for a story. You don't have a main point and three minor points, generally. What you do have is a complication, followed by a development, maybe two or three developments, even in a short story, you'll, you'll usually have two or three developments. In other words, things that happen while you're trying to, well, while you're acting to resolve the initial conflict. Something happens, and then you, you try X to see if you can resolve it. It doesn't work. Maybe it gets worse. So you try uh, the next thing, and that leads to the next thing. You, it may maybe three or four of these even in a simple story, before you get to a resolution. The resolution is the point at which um, uh, the meaning of the story or the experience you wanted to convey comes clear. Um, so rather than going on talking sort of abstractly without um, clear examples, what I would like to do is to have you read a true story, a nonfiction story, um, so that I can kind of talk about all of this in the context of, of an example that we have in common. So I've uploaded to the website um, a story by John Franklin. It's called Mrs. Kelly's Monster. Uh, he won a Pulitzer Prize for writing this. I mean, if I didn't tell you it was a true story, you might mistake it for fiction. It is a true story, but it's not an essay. And I, He's a journalist, but it's not, a, uh, it's not an article. It's actually a story. Uh, obviously, to write this story, it's not in first person, so he had to go do a lot of interviewing. He had to stand into an emergency room and watch, watch an operation. Um, uh, people like the story. I found that, that kids like to read it. I think it's eight or nine um, typewritten pages, and it won't take a long time to read. But as you read it, pay attention to the way that the conflict is introduced and once the conflict is introduced most of the story is um, the narrator he's a surgeon the narrator attempting something that leads to a, a new problem and so he meets that new problem and he he attempts to solve that and that just keeps continuing right up until the climax and then there's a very brief denouement resolution but it's it's very well done i mean and it, it kind of illustrates in in a sense how simple it is i mean people look for 
big things when very often it's paying close attention to the little things that can make a story really strong. Okay, I'll stop there for now. Um, uh, get download, read online, or download a copy of Mrs. Kelly's Monster, and I'll see you next time.